So guys, do me a favor. Let's welcome everyone that's watching online and here for the first time. Um, we're in a series about um, the book of Ephesians, and we're going to continue with it today. And I remember, uh, how many remember 9-11? Yeah. I remember where I was that day. Uh, my brother wasn't on one of the Twin Towers. It was a difficult day. And something, uh, a, fringe benefit, a, fringe, a fringe benefit, what happened as a result of 9-11 was there was unity in our country. I mean, it was amazing. I mean, everywhere you went, there was an American flag, <coughs> excuse me, on someone's window flying by. I mean, people were all together. We worked together. It was a beautiful thing. Didn't last very long, but we were unified. And there was a beautiful unity that took place. Back in 1977, in New York City, there was a power outage, which created absolute anarchy, looting, violence, murder. It was, it was the Gotham City Batman works in. That's how bad it got. If you don't know who Gotham City and Batman is, it's fictitious. I'll talk to you after. But it was so bad. It was horrible, and, it, and uh, it was a tremendous amount of destruction and fighting and all that. It was horrible. But you know what happened? It was really amazing. After 9-11, we were such a unified country that there was a blackout, another blackout in Manhattan. The first blackout took place in July 13, 1977, and then August 14, 2003, there was another blackout in New York City. So no security cameras, nothing, no lights, completely blackout. And everyone's, the law enforcement, everyone's like, oh my God, what's going to happen? Do you know what happened? There wasn't one crime that we know of. People worked together to help each other out. The whole city came together. And there was no violence, there was no looting. It was like Mayberry from Andy Griffith show. If you don't know what that is, I'm really, TV land is a beautiful place to be. But anyhow, so it was absolutely amazing that here you had a contrast between 1977 where everyone's out for their own and here we are in 2003, August 14th, there is complete unity and people are helping each other out. They're helping them get across on the ferries and all these wonderful things and it was amazing. Newscasters were dumbfounded and the reason was we were unified under one purpose. Our nation was under attack and New York City took the brunt of that attack and New York City City residents were united and they were one. African American, Chinese, Hispanics, gang members, and Wall Street executives all worked together. Even the gangs. It was amazing. And perhaps one of the most amazing things I remember is also in the rotunda of the Capitol building in Washington, D.C., the Democrats and Republicans prayed to God together. It was beautiful. It was, you remember that feel? I don't know if you don't, if you weren't born then, it was a really cool feeling. And in many ways, uh, my dad said it reminded him of a World War II when we were fighting against Hitler. There was a unity in our country. The women went to the factories, you know, the, I mean, as the men were fighting, everyone came together, right? We, there was a uniformity that happened and we were joined together. And I would even say this, even during the Cold War, even though the 60s were, were a difficult time, there was something about having a common enemy that brought us together. Now today, it's a different story, isn't it? Today, it's all about dividing. We're dividing. And by the way, there is a tactic of the enemy. If he can divide us, he can what? Conquer us. Right. So there's power in unity. And I, I know I quote this often, but uh, one of the greatest theologians that I know of in the comic strips is Lucy from Peanuts. And talking to Charlie Brown, she said, Charlie Brown, these five fingers by themselves do nothing. But when they come together, they make a mighty force to be reckoned with. There's something that God has given us in unity is so powerful. Now, we don't just unify over nonsense. As a matter of fact, I remember my, a story of my brother, uh, Glenn. God bless Glenn. Uh, we were in Long Island, New York at the time. We was at a place called Roosevelt Field, which was a mall. And as he was going through the mall to go back to the car, there was this couple, I mean, going at it, yelling and screaming. 
Uh, the guy was throwing things at the girl. He was pushing her. And my brother, you know, being a godly boochie like me, is like, hey, hey, let's knock it off. He started to tell the guy to stop. And know what happened? The woman and the man turned on my brother and threatened to beat him up. Why? Because their unity was threatened by my masculine brother. But you see, something that brings us together. We have something so much greater than that. The reason why a lot of us don't function in the capacity of strength and power in our lives is because we're not unified. We're separated by different tribes. And I'm, I'm really concerned, uh, by the way, because uh, I don't know if you recognize it, but we're always in a political season. And the political parties are trying to divide us. Because when you divide and demonize your opponent, you can raise money. And what drives these campaigns is money. It's going to be like a billion dollars per each presidential candidate. I'm telling you. And so the, you're not going to raise money. Hey, he's a pretty good guy. No, you got to demonize your opponent. So what has happened is we're being played. And we're sucking in the world's way. And then we bring division in our homes. We start dividing over things that matter not. The only thing I can really think about that we need to divide over is between the Boston Red Sox and the New York Yankees. But besides that, so what we're talking about here is unity today. I want to talk about unity today and, uh, and what happened in New York and the amazing things that took place in New York through that proce process. We need absolute unity. How is that possible? It is possible. It is possible. You see, focusing on our faith's absolutes in Christ to keep us united. Focusing on our faith's absolutes in Christ to keep us united. That's how we have absolute unity. And my friends, we can have it here at Cornerstone. You can have it in your family. And so today we're going to look at some of the secrets that create that unity that's powerful. The Bible says in Psalm 133 how blessed it is when brethren dwell together in unity. It includes women as well. It says it is there that God commands his blessing evermore. Blessing is what you need, power and strength. So what does the enemy want to do? He wants to keep us in disunity. So the church should be the place where we have the most unity in the world. The world should look to the church <clears throat> and be amazed. Look at the diversity of people, the diversity of different ethnicities, the diversity of the social economic places, and look how they are one. And I'm proud to say, no, I'm not proud to say, I'm happy to say that I believe that we're becoming more and more of that here at Cornerstone. It isn't just one type of people that we're working together to see unity, and the world is looking for a place where they all get along. And not by lowering our standards. So focusing on our faith's absence in Christ to keep us united. So what we're going to do today, we're going to look at Ephesians, which is all about this, that our identity leads us to our destiny. All right? So we've been talking about that week in and week out, and the only way, if you know what you are as a church you know as you are as an individual, you can reach your destiny, and God has good plans for us. Your, your identity leads you to your destiny. So the enemy always wants to redefine us. He wants to label us. He wants us to change our language of who I am. Well, stupid me, I'm a sinner. I know. We want to speak the truth. And that's why there's so much confusion in identity because it's a major tactic the enemy uses. That's why we always have to tell each other who we are in Christ Jesus. We talked about that. So our identity, we cannot find who we are without knowing who God is. This is how it works if you gave your life to Christ. If we want to change our destiny... We must change what we think about God and we think about ourselves. Remember, everybody, the two most important thoughts that you and I can think at any given time that shapes the way we live our lives is what we think about God and what we think about ourselves. What we think about God, even if you don't think about God, then you don't care about God, you live for yourself. What we think about God and what we think about each other. So today what we're going to look at 
is our identity. So we're going to read uh, the, the couple of verses there, 1 to 6 in Ephesians. When we're done with that, we're going to go line by line, verse by verse, because this is, this is packed full of amazing, uh, we call it theology, theology, study of God, how God's kingdom works. And if you and I will employ these things, I'm telling you, you're going to have a much better life than you would by yourself. And we'll be able to do things that actually change society, that we can see cities change, families change, communities change. I'm telling you that it works because there's power in the unity of Jesus Christ. And I want to encourage you with that today. So let's go ahead and, and read this right now. And let me to give you a little more background. The Apostle Paul, who is one of the greatest in the, um, in the Bible, wrote a third of the New Testament. He is writing to a church in Ephesus region, which is modern-day Turkey. He uh, was visited this place perhaps about 10 years earlier. Now he's in prison. He's in prison, and he's chained to a Roman guard. And he's writing. He's there for about five years. He's writing a letter to these people. And so to complain about a set of circumstances he found himself in, he found an opportunity to do something even greater. So now he's going to write to us again. This is like the the fourth chapter. He's talked a lot about who who we are in Christ, our identity in Christ. I'm not going to go back right now. You can go back to cornerstonecheshire.com. You can go to iTunes or Spotify, put Cornerstone Cheshire, and you can catch up on the series, okay? So here we go. Now he's saying therefore again, and therefore means what was before. As a result of the first three chapters, now we're going to get into more of the pragmatic and practical parts. The first three chapters were primarily dealing with with theology or, if you will, good doctrine. Now we're going to walk it out. How do you walk it out with your wife? How do you walk it out with your boss? How do you walk it out with people that are different than you? How do you walk out your life in Christ? And how do you fight the spiritual battles that are about us? That's the rest of our time in Ephesians. So here we go. Ready? Say yes. Yes. If you're not ready, don't tell me. I, therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain The unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body. There is one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to you, your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. That's seven ones. I counted. I'm so wise. Okay. One God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. So, here we end this. It almost sounds like he's ending here, and he's not. So, let's go back and look at it. He says, therefore, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord. Notice, he does not say that I'm a prisoner of Rome. He does not say it stinks to be in this country. I hate being in Rome. It's such a liberal place. I need to go to a place in America that has no one there but Indians. He doesn't say that. He says, I am a prisoner of what? Of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is so identified with his relationship with Jesus that he says, I am a prisoner of Christ. I'm a prisoner of Christ. So, yeah, they may have me incarcerated. Mm -mm, They don't. I'm a prisoner of Christ. I am so committed to him that Jesus is incarcerated. I'm not incarcerated completely. I am of Christ. My friends, when you and I understand our identity, that we are of Jesus Christ, that we have authority, we we have rights bequeathed to us as children of God, we can put our head back and the shoulders back in the middle of difficulty. He says, I am a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Of the Lord. He goes, I urge you, therefore, to walk in a manner worthy. He says, walk is how to live your life. We're not talking about theology. Well, I want you to have good theology. No. He says, I want you to walk out what's true. I want you to walk it out at work. I want you to walk it out in your marriage. I want you to walk it out what's true about you. And that's really true. A lot of folks say, you know, I, I would love Christianity if they just did what they said. And so we want to walk out, right? A walk in the manner worthy of the what? Calling 
Do you know that all of you have a calling? It's, you know what the calling there in the Greek is? It's vocation. A lot of us have taken a vacation from our vocation, and we've never come back. You see, all of us have a purpose. We have a calling. God has called you for a purpose. You're not just here to compare yourselves to the other people on social media. You're not here to go back to a high school reunion and show that you've done better than those that were there. No, God has us here for a calling. If we lose our calling, we lose our focus. When we lose our focus, we lose our impact. So what is your calling? Each of us have been given gifts. We're going to talk about that next week. Each of you have been given gifts that no one in the world does or can have but you. So we're calling to which you have been called. You are called by Jesus Christ. Christ has chosen you from the foundations of the earth. Well, who chose who? It doesn't make a difference. God reached out to you. You responded back. You could not respond without God calling to you, but God has called you. It says in the book of uh, 1 Peter, he wants none to perish, but all to come to faith. So you are called by God. You're not some accident. You're not some random accident. God has a purpose and a plan for you. If you are homebound in a, in a bed all day long, you still have a purpose. God can utilize you to pray. God can utilize you to do something. So we have to understand, like the Apostle Paul, no matter where we find ourselves, we want to be in the middle of what God is calling us to. You have been called. Now, he says here, calling to which you've been called, so of Christ Jesus. So basically, it talks about an axiom, which is actually we get the word scales in the Greek. And so Jesus has, has given us all the calling. He saved us. He gave us everything we need. And so the scale's like this. Christ has given us everything we need. And we're like, we're so far behind, right? The good news is the moment you surrender to Christ is the moment you are you are worthy. You are accepted despite your issues that require your tissues. Okay? And this is what happened. So he said, walk worthy of the calling. Now, what is that supposed to mean? The call of our purpose. What's the call of our purpose? Salvation. You're saved by grace, not by works, lest anyone can boast. So the man on the cross, if you're not familiar, Jesus was being uh, crucified, and there was a prisoner, a man on the cross. He says, Jesus, remember me today, and he gave his life to Christ. Says, Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. The guy never went to church. He never got his act together. He never asked for, you know, he didn't, he was, he just, he just surrendered. And immediately he was accepted. So it's not like you have to do all these things and then God will, no. God says, I'll take you just as you are. And I love you way too much to have you stay there. But Jesus accepts us where we're at. We don't have to work for it. All we have to do is accept it. Now, there's some truth in here I need to explain to you about that. All right? So, so salvation. When you gave your life to Christ, your justification, which I'm sorry, Sometimes we actually have to do some theology. Is that okay, everybody? Put your little thinking hats on just for a moment. I think we need to learn what the Bible is, not just about, uh, you know, these things to make you happier. This is important, okay? Justification means you are justified as if you never sinned. So when you gave your life to Christ, you're justified. Yeah, you may have messed up on four marriages. Yeah, you may have been involved with drug addiction. Yeah, you may have been involved with things that you're so ashamed of. Anyone ever knew they would dis disassociate from you. But the moment you give your life to Christ, all the shame of, of, of you goes into Christ, and you are justified. Positionally, you are Christ in heaven. So you are accepted. God has bought you. You are not your own anymore. Now you're ownership of the king. He's bought you and you are his. Immediately your position is there. Now the next part of it is this. Now we have a sanctification. What does that mean? Okay, you're justified already if you gave a lot to Christ. Now sanctification does not mean you have to earn it. Now you are measuring up to your justification. You are getting the characteristics of your justification. And when you get the characteristics of your justification, you find more freedom. You find more happiness. You find more wholeness. You find more purpose. And your life actually means something. And you begin to, super, you begin to supersede situations on the earth. So justification growing in a position. 
God is giving us everything that's all purchased. You are in your love as much as Billy Graham and some guy that, that just gives his life to Christ who's in prison. God loves you both the same. You're, you are accepted, but God loves us so much, he wants us to experience the freedom he has for us, right? And God's ways, they bring you freedom. Sin is easy, and it will complicate your life where you hold your head in your hands, don't know what to do. Following Jesus and loving Christ is exceedingly simple, profound, and deep beyond, beyond the ability to even understand. But it simplifies your life. And now your life's not so complicated. Aren't you tired of complications? Sin will complicate your life. So anyone says, I'm in a relationship and it's complicated. Yeah, that means there's a lot of sin. When you have nothing to hide, it's great. So sanctification is growing in your position. You follow me? And then the third one is glorification. What that is? That's when we finally reach heaven. We're never going to be here until either Christ comes back or we meet, him in, we meet him in the air or we go to heaven. And that's complete in heaven. That's happening. So you and I are all in this part of sanctification. But you are justified through Christ. All right? I want you to understand that, everybody. That's what's so beautiful. No matter where you are, no matter if you've been, mar- if you've been a, cr- a Christian for 15 minutes or 50 years, we are all justified in Christ. Isn't that beautiful, everybody? Isn't it nice we don't have to have this caste system? Come on. The whole world is about haves and have-nots. The haves don't like the nots, and the nots don't like the haves. It's crazy. We just blow that away through Christ Jesus. It's beautiful. It really is. And this is part of our salvation. Now, he goes this. Therefore, a prisoner of the Lord urge you to walk in a manner worthy of your calling, which I just explained to you, sanctification, I mean, uh, justification, sanctification, and then to moving to glorification, right? Worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all Humility. You know what's so amazing when I read this uh, word, I did some research on it. Do you know the word humility doesn't even have its place in the Greek language of the time the Apostle Paul wrote this? Do you know why? Do you know 30% of society in ancient civilizations was in slavery? 30%. So that would be the equivalent. We're about 330 million people in America. That would mean there'd be 100 million people that were living in slavery, did not have no rights. So you always had these people that were better than other people. That's what slavery did. Okay, so they they, they couldn't even fathom what humility was. It was considered weak to be humble. You always had to put your, and this is not, and this is something that was, you can't even find the word for it. And, and the Greek language has three times the vocabulary the English language has. Just the word love alone has four different meanings. So here, they couldn't even define it. So guess who defined humility? It was the Christian church. The body of Christ actually brought meaning to humility. And it wasn't being humiliated, it was lowering yourself. So with all humility, what does that mean? Like a C.S. Lewis said, true humility is not thinking less of yourself. It is thinking of yourself less. <laughs> Which would be, be a nice thing to do, wouldn't it? Yeah. And most of the time, and most of the times uh, in our arguments, in our, dis- in our discussions, in our home, with people, that I, the person I love the most, it's usually about, I want my way. So the call of our purpose, the way of our purpose is through community. Those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. What did Jesus do? As the Father sent me, so I send you. Let's get right to it. You must have the same attitude, same thinking process. Your attitude is a thinking process. It's a program running in your mind that gets to your subconscious. You see, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Okay? Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to be clung to, even though he was. Instead, he what? He gave up. He surrendered. He gave up his divine privileges. He was willing to give up his divine privileges. What 
What would happen if you have a family gathering for Christmas or something like that, or you have a business thing, and you have all these successful people, you're trying to network and trying to get someone. What would happen if you actually invited somebody that barely could make it, and you showed them the same respect as the person that could give you that business deal? Now, obviously, you still need to go after the business deals. Don't get me wrong. But the value sequence of it. That's why, the apostle, that's why the apostle Paul and Jesus even says, and when someone comes in your, in your midst that has no money, and you, don't, don't ignore them. Don't, don't give preference to the wealthy and the rich or the opposite or punish the rich. But give that, right? So you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, did not think of equality with God as something to be grasped, but he gave up his divine privileges he took the <clears throat> humble position of a what? Yeah, you have to understand, when he said slave, 30% of the population was a slave, was in slavery, and was born as a human being when he appeared in human form. So by, in Romans 12, he says this, for by the grace given to me, grace is God's grace, right? Unmerited favor. I say to everyone among you, not to what? Think of himself or herself more highly than they ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. All I have to do, I don't know how, I don't know how it is for you guys, but the longer I'm alive, the, the easier it is for me to bestow grace upon other people. When I was younger, I had very little grace. But when I keep on trying to follow God and I think I'm doing well and I fall, I'm like, okay, God, I get it, right? Okay, so, and with all humility, okay, the Bible says God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So if you want to be opposed by God, be proud. Pride comes before the fall. We fight pride by humility. Pride is the first original sin. Pride is poisonous. With all humility and what? gentleness. It doesn't sound very masculine to me. I don't want to be a gentle man. Yeah. You know what a gentle man really is? Gentleman is not that you're weak or a gentle person. It's strength under control. It's like a horse could buck you right off in a second. But that horse is broken under the master. It's just not broken in its strength. It's broken in its will. And this is what God has for us. So, and gentleness with patience, bearing with one another in love. Oh boy, here we go. Yeah, let's look at this here. So brothers, check this out. If anyone is caught in a transgression, you make a mistake, you sin. You who are spiritual should restore him or her in a spirit of what? Gen off with, cancel him. <laughs> Aren't you tired of the cancel culture? We should all be canceled. Everyone, our entire country, every person, you should all be canceled, and I'm the first one to be canceled. Thank God we're not all canceled. All right? So, with gentleness, keep watch of yourself, lest you too be tempted. If you start acting arrogant, there was a, number, there was a man a number of years ago, there's no one in our church, let me make that abundantly clear, we're talking 20, over 20 years ago. There was a man who was married to a woman, and his wife cheated on him many times, and they got a divorce. He was bitter about his wife. When we at worship rehearsal, he would say, oh, my ex-wife. Oh, my ex was this. Oh, my he was bitter on her. Well, he met another woman, a lovely woman. They got married. Five years into their marriage, guess what he did? He cheated. Why? Because he was proud and arrogant and unforgiven. And the enemy had access to his life because of it. Be careful that we don't become haughty. Remember, everybody, you must understand, you, everyone can fall. You're capable of every sin. No, I'm not. If you don't understand the fact that you, have, you can have the propensities, you have the, you have the potential to be the worst sinner you could ever imagine. And you know what that keeps me sane and keeps me pure and keeps me holy is the fact that I'm aware of that. I'm like a man working on high powered lines. I respect the power lines and I respect what happens if I sin because I know what can happen to me. Keep watch of yourself lest you to be tempted. So with all humility and gentleness with what? Patience. Patience. Okay. Can I be honest with you? Of course, I want to be true with you. I don't, I don't 
I, I struggle in this area. You know when I struggle with this the most? When I go to a restaurant or when I go to a place that has coffee. Just the other day, it's like yesterday. <clears throat> I mean, I went in this coffee shop. There was four workers there. I had a bag of coffee I wanted to buy because I grind my own beans and I pour over and I'm a, I'm a, I'm a coffee snob. And I bring it to them. I kid you not, there was one person in front of me. It took 22 minutes and 45 seconds before the transaction of my bag of coffee was completed. And I asked myself the question, why do I keep coming to this place? I, was, I, had, I had to walk out. I was like... There's like blood coming down. And then I go to New York City, my wife, right? We go to a coffee shop, and the guys are, I mean, they're like, this is like, this is awesome. Anyhow. Oh, okay. With patience, patience, bearing with one another, actually putting up with stuff, being patient, Christ bear with you. That means I'm going to give you patience. doesn't mean we allow nonsense in our life. That's not good either. But we are patient, realizing it takes time. Real, how patient is God with you when you understand that? I need to wrap this up soon. Eager to maintain the unity. Notice. It doesn't say, hey, guys, I want you to create unity. It didn't say that. Maintain unity. When you give your life to Christ, we are automatically unified. I love it when I go to another country or another place, and I'm in Indonesia. I'm, I'm with the pygmies. I'm in different places, and I'll meet someone, and we are instantaneous. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. It's beautiful because we have the, we have the commonality of Christ. You know what I'm talking about, everybody? You meet somebody, it's like, whoa, wait. We are family, right? Immediately, all my brothers, sisters, and me. Okay. All right. Eager to maintain the unity of the what? The spirit brings us unity. So it's there. So it's, we don't have to create it, everybody. We just have to protect it and maintain it and continue to put the fire on it. In other words, keep putting you put on the wood of fire. Maintain the spirit of bond of peace. There is one body. So let's continue to look at this. Uh, how many like how, um, mayonnaise? I do. I, I, like, I like mayonnaise, especially on a hamburger. I like to put a lot of tomatoes and lettuce, pickles, and uh, I like to put the mayonnaise on there. It's a, I just like mayonnaise. But be careful because it, it can make you sick if it stays out too long. Oh, yeah, that's beside the point. Now, there, have you ever heard of the word emulsifier? You know what that is? You see, the problem with mayonnaise is this. You have oil and you have water. The two don't mix. No matter how hard you try, they do not mix. And so you put them together, they go apart. So you need some component that brings these opposites together. And an emulsifier is necessary. It's a chemical reaction that brings diverging and separate things that would never come together that come together. And guess what the emulsifier in, Hel well, in, in Helen's, Hellman's, sorry, Helen. Uh, guess what the em emulsifier is? It's eggs. The eggs bring it all together. So what brings us different people together it's the emulsifier of the blood of christ that brings us together what brings a marriage together is both of you not trying to become a better person but sacrificing more to christ we become better in that so in essentials unity and non-essentials liberty and all things charity now what is that supposed to mean i'm so glad you asked all right now if it looks complicated, I'm sorry. But uh, make sure we can see that. You guys can spring it in just a little bit there so they can see it. Okay, so prayer, okay, here we go. This is how we keep unity, all right? We need to focus on the absolutes. The absolutes. This is something I'll take a bullet for. I'm not going to take a bullet if we have uh, lights or no lights. I'm not going to take a bullet for a choir robe or uh, jeans and sneakers or whatever or holes in my jeans. I I'm not going to, I know, I I'm not going to take a bullet for that. But if someone says, Christ, are you, will you deny Christ? No, I'll take a bullet for that. So absolutes, Jesus, salvation, God. He rose from the dead. This is what brings you to Christ Jesus. This is the absolute. This is a non-negotiable. We focus on the core absolutes. We do not deviate from that. Okay, then you come to the essentials in theology. This is all very important 
But you don't have to have all your theology right to become a Christian. You have to sacrifice your life to Christ in as, as messed up as we could be. Then we have essentials in theology. Number one, we believe the Bible is infallible, theologically speaking. The Bible is our final, our final standards of what we believe. It's the word that became true, right? I don't have time today to share with you why we believe, but that's the case why. We believe the Bible, and there's a lot of evidence for the Bible. The Bible is our theology our, about forgiveness, love your neighbor, about uh, eternity, about um, marriage and family. It's all right there. And that we do not, that's essentials. Okay, do I take a bowl for some of these things? Maybe not, but I take a bowl for this. You see that? Okay, then we come to this. Important but not essential. I think we should be sprinkled. I think we should be dunked. I think you should put this donut in the coffee. I don't think you should have coffee. I don't think you should have donuts. Okay. So you have baptism methods. You have different things like that, right? And you have different views on things. I think we need to have more legitery, uh, legitery, <laughs> uh, liturgic, more liturgic service, what have you. Okay. You have that important but not essentials. Then you have a theology emphasis in views. For example, I believe it's pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, amillennialism, no millennialism. I believe in the pan theory. What does that mean? It all is going to pan out in the end. Okay. So we have people that fight over this. And, uh, and, and also, this is important too, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We believe that the Spirit of God is here today. We believe all nine gifts are available to us today. We believe we need to ask for it and we will receive it. Others don't believe that. I'm not gonna, it's important, but it's it essential. It's essential for me, but is it essential to not being unity with somebody outside? No. Then we have the theology. You see that, everybody? And then here we go. This is the problem we often have. We have preferences and opinions. I could tell you a funny story, but time is running out. So preference and opinion. Well, you cannot wear shorts in church. I mean, there was a point, there was a point in time you couldn't put a ball cap on in church because it meant it was very disrespectful. I understand that in that day. But that's a cultural thing, right? So you have preferences. To, I think they should just sing out of the hymn book. I think they should wear suits and ties. I, I, I got pulled over in Texas, and I almost got shot. I'm not kidding you here. I was selling books door to door, and a pastor came up to me and says, I can't believe you're selling the word of God in a pair of shorts. I, I'm not exaggerating. That's what he did. Yeah. So that preference became an absolute. And the problems you and I have is, I think worship should be 20 minutes. I think it should be 14 minutes and 35 seconds. I think we should let the spirit flow all day long until 5 o'clock at night. That's true, church. In the New Testament, that's what they did. And we'll fight over what preferences. I think it should be 53 degrees. I think we should have hanging meat in the church. It's so cold. I think we should have it hot where people are falling asleep. It's too loud. It's too soft. It's like Goldilocks, right? So, and you know how much we fight over these types of things? I mean, my, my dad's old church, a woman slapped another woman over the color on the carpet in a, in a congregational meeting. Slapped another woman. My dad won a lot of money because she beat her. Anyhow, all right, just kidding. All right, so you have preference and opinions, feelings, cultural norms. I mean, right now, it used to be you wore a hat. It's disrespectful. Today, things have changed. You follow me, everybody? We got to let some of this stuff go. One time, one time I was preaching in Indonesia, I kid you not, you know, my, and it's, it's really inappropriate. This woman took off her shirt, buck naked, and started feeding her child. She's sitting in right in the front row. And I'm like, okay, I'll keep on preaching. I'm not going to look down. I'm going to keep looking this way. Now, obviously, we don't do that here, right? But over there, it was appropriate. It will never be appropriate at Cornerstone Church, let me tell you right now, Okay. <laughs> Well, that's cultural norms. You get, it's okay. You got to, you know, uh, pastor, are you for nudist colonies? No. Okay. Eager to maintain the unity. I'm going to ask the worship team to make their way up. Eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to you. Behold, the Bible says, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity. It's there God commands the blessing. If you want to have God commanding blessing in your life, let's be unified. Let's not, let's not get caught up. Let's not get caught up in this stuff. I think it's too loud. Well, listen, I, I know people say it's too loud. Well, let me just tell you right now. We have actually done scientific study, and we have working with OSHA to make sure we don't hurt anyone's ears. 
Seriously, we, we, are, we care about those types of things. So we're going to focus on these things. But let's not leave a church over this or over this. But, you know, this is what we should be able to be focusing on. Okay, as we move forward, okay, how blessed it is. So the call of our purpose is to be like Christ, right? The way of our purpose is through Christ. And the power of our purpose is through the Holy Spirit where we work together. And then the oneness of our purpose. One Lord. We serve one Lord, everybody. One faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all, who's over all. The Amalsifer, what, what brings us together? It's Jesus Christ. Let's focus on the absolutes and focus on loving each other, having charity to each other, and let's remember that. That's what hold us together, everybody. That's important. It's okay to have your distinctions. I understand that's why there's different types of churches out there. You follow me, everybody? But we, have to, we can be in fellowship with people who believe that. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. So all this diversity goes into Christ, and out of that comes great diversity. Jews, Greeks, slaves, free, were made to think of the spirit. So absolute unity, focusing on our faith's absolutes in Christ to keep us united. Let me say that again. Focusing on our faith's absolutes. Focus on the absolutes. In Christ, to keep us united. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for this opportunity to gather here today. I thank you, Father God, that you love every single person here. And Lord, I know this has been more of a theological and more of a, um, of a study, more than it would be a typical type of sermon. But Father, I thank you for the truth that we've shared today from your word. Father, I ask in Jesus' name that we, your church, that we would think beyond ourselves. Lord Jesus, that we'd be like you. We'd be willing to lay aside our preferences to reach the next generation. We'd be willing, Lord, to, to lay down the cool to help those that are more mature in the faith because we want to reach them as well. Father, that we would not regard equality with you something to be grasped, but we like you, Jesus, that we'd empty ourselves and be humble. Father, I ask your blessing to be upon this church. I pray for unity, God, in this time. I even pray during this political season, oh God, that we would stay unified. We would stay focused on our position in you, and we would not let the political parties bring division to our church. Lord, you are the utmost of all things in Jesus' name. Father, I pray for unity. Will you would bless our church and command your blessing on this place, Father. I declare Cornerstone Church is unified in Christ Jesus. And you will grow us and command your blessing on this place in Jesus' name.